afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's learning exchange on addressing the harm reduction and treatment needs of women and gender diverse people who use drugs. My name is Pam Lees. I'm a public health physician at Public Health Ontario, and it's um, I have the pleasure of moderating today's session uh, with Ashley Smoke. Um, before we begin, uh, just some housekeeping items before the presentation. Uh, the present session includes a short presentation followed by a panel discussion, and we'll save our questions to the end of the panel discussion. Um, please use the chat pod to type in your uh, questions or your raise hand icon to ask your questions um, to the group verbally. And at any point during the session, if you have technical issues, you can email capacitybuilding at oahpp.ca. The presentation is recorded and posted on the Public Health Ontario website two weeks after the live discussion. Um, and uh, um, in discussing the topic of uh, the meeting today, um, meeting the needs of women and gender diverse people who use drugs, we recognize that at the core of this conversation are structural factors that produce inequities for women and gender diverse people. Um, and these intersect with other identities and social positions such as class and race and stigma around drug use. So in the conversation, we will use this lens and even while discussing programs and individual level approaches to meet one's needs. And so we look forward to creating a safe environment free of discrimination in this discussion and holding a really productive um, uh, conversation today. So I'll now um, introduce you to uh, Ashley Smoke. It's my pleasure to. Um, and uh, Ashley is an Indigenous Two-Spirit Anishinaabe person from Alderville First Nations. They have lived experience with substance use, sex work, mental health, criminalization, violent, violence against women, and poverty. Um, they helped to create the Peel Drug Users Network and the Ontario Network of People Who Use Drugs. They currently work at the University of Victoria um, and University of Toronto on a project about women and gender diverse populations participating in community-based research. So Ashley also advises and consults on a variety of other projects for different agencies. Um, and I'll turn it over to, uh, to Ashley for our acknowledgements and we'll come back to do a couple of polling questions afterwards. Over to you, Ashley. Thanks, Pam. Good afternoon, everyone. My name's Ashley Smoke and I'm, Pam just, kind of introduced me but I'm a, a community member um, and I'm with Ontario Network of People Who Use Drugs who um, take a, a leadership role and work with COMCAP and addressing the overdose crisis. Um, so I'm going to do a land acknowledgement. I don't usually do land acknowledgements because I feel it's a bit disrespectful to ask Indigenous person to do a land acknowledgement. Um, but I chose to do this um, to do a kind of a, a different, a varied version of a land acknowledgement. Um, I've been taught by a lot of elders that in settings such as this, it can be very tokenistic, but I offered so that I could share some teachings and lessons that I've learned and thoughts I've had around this whole practice. We do these land acknowledgements not for us or to help repair the damages done by colonization, although I'm sure Western society feels that it helps, but we do them to remind you of the effects on our people and the shock waves that continue on today. We understand our relationship with the land and how we need to keep it sacred, but that is lost among Western society. I own a house on a land that was stolen from my ancestors generations ago. They roamed all along the lands in my regions, although what we have now is a small reserve 30 minutes away that spans a short distance. I won't name the treaty I live on because it is a reminder of the colonization and the effects of my family and my people have endured. I appreciate and have a special relationship with the land on which I reside, so I will say instead that I want to acknowledge that we are all on ceded and unceded lands and we all live here on Turtle Island, and we need to acknowledge that and give thanks to the ex uh, give thanks that we can experience this wonderful country and province. I also want to urge you to not read a generic land acknowledgement next time but create one. Tell us how you can improve relations to the land think about how you can truly reconcile with indigenous communities in a meaningful way. 
Land acknowledgements are unique to everyone, and I would love to see more authentic and genuine land acknowledgements in order to come together collectively and appreciate this beautiful land on which we all live in a respectful way. And in terms of acknowledging the leadership of people who use drugs on um, today's webinar, I'd like to read um, a statement that the Ontario network of people who use drugs use to like ground us in our work and to remind us of what we're doing um, and what we're fighting for. In recognition of today's webinar, we'd like to reflect and remember all the people who use drugs who have lost their lives, but especially the women and gender diverse populations who have lost their lives because of many factors, including a toxic and illicit supply of drugs supported by failed racist and sexist drug policies. Today, communities across Ontario grieve over tragedies of lives lost due to the overdose crisis, which during COVID-19 has been mostly ignored because of the stigma and criminalization that people who use drugs and their loved ones experience. People will continue to lose their friends, family, and loved ones if the health disparities and harmful drug policies remain unaddressed and unchanged. We will continue to see the number of fatalities rise. People who use drugs have been on the front lines of this war for far too long and ask that during this upcoming election, the provincial government responds meaningfully to our cries for support and properly addresses long-term policy changes, including decriminalization and legalization of all substances and utilizing meaningful engagement with people who use drugs. People who use drugs and their allies have been resilient, but we cannot continue to see our friends die. The time for talk is over. We need to we need immediate action to ensure that change and we need it now. This is a public health crisis and health pandemic and should be recognized as such and addressed with evidence based initiatives. Um, and then I just want to acknowledge that we know and love people who use who use drugs and we are remembering over 27,000 Canadians who died from overdoses since 2016. It's my pleasure to introduce the speakers, Julian Gittleman, Molly Bannerman, and Matt Kaminsky. Julian is a fourth year public health and preventative medicine resident at University of Toronto. He completed medical school at McGill University and a master of public health at Harvard University. Ooh. Molly Bannerman has worked in the field of community development, social work, sexual health, harm reduction, arts-based practice, community-based research, and restorative conflict resolution since the early 2000s. She grew up between Galt, Ontario, land of the Halamand Tract and part of Treaty 3 and Oliphant on Lake Huron, land of the Chippewas of Nawesh First Nations, and Treaty 72. Molly completed University of Molly completed her master's in social work focusing on community development and harm reduction at the University of Toronto. Molly currently works as the provincial director of the Women and HIV AIDS Initiative of Toronto. Nat Kaminsky is from the Peel region where they work in harm reduction and founded the Peel Drug Users Network. Throughout their 20s and early 30s, they lived in London, Ontario, and became embedded in poverty, experienced systemic violence, being a person who uses drugs, engaged in sex work, and had a history of incarceration. Most of Nat's friends that shared those experiences are either missing, murdered, dead, or dying due to failed policies. Nat is a white settler on Turtle Island and committed in their various roles, included, including mother, to dismantle the patriarchal and oppressive systems that uphold policies that kill people they love. So now we're going to go over to Julian. So the I'm going to present preliminary findings from a rapid review that I did um, with um, Treaty and Pam while I was doing a rotation at PHO. Um, the aim of this rapid review was to describe interventions that harm reduction and treatment programs have implemented to meet the unique needs of women and gender diverse individuals who use opioids, and to describe any process or health outcomes measured for the interventions. Uh, next slide. So just a few words on our approach to reiterate some of the um, 
things that Pam um, and Ashley said. We understand uh, patterns of substance use to be rooted in unequal social, economic, and political positions due to false hierarchies of sex, gender, race, and class. We understand that these structural factors are the cause of inequities for women and gender diverse individuals who use substances. And we reject framings that position health as a result of individual behaviors and individual level phenomena that are devoid of their social context. And we also understand that people's experiences of substance use intersect with marginalization that they may experience due to other um, social oppressions. So we thought it was important to include this framing because the studies that we examine don't necessarily share this framing. So um, just wanting to acknowledge that. Um, next slide, we did a rapid review and these are the pre preliminary findings which will be added to as other databases get added to the search. Um, worked with a librarian to develop the search strategy. Medline was searched for the following concepts. So um, women and gender diverse individuals, opioids, harm reduction services, which included supervised consumption sites, uh, needle and syringe distribution, safer supply and peer support programs, uh, opioid agonist treatment and public policy. And uh, studies were included if they were published in North America, Europe or Australia, which we thought were comparable contexts to Ontario. Um, they were included if, uh, the, they included uh, women or gender diverse individuals who use opioids and studies were um, had to be specifically designed, the interventions in the studies needed to be specifically designed for women or gender diverse individuals. Um, next slide. So the studies that met our inclusion criteria had um, the following types of information extracted from them. Um, so a description of the intervention, um, what determinants were targeted by the intervention or what, um, what needs were expressed or observed uh, that the interventions were attempting to address, um, any outcome measures, the results of the study and any barriers or facilitators to success of the intervention. Next slide. So the 414 records were screened by title and abstract 27 uh, full texts were reviewed and 17 met our inclusion criteria. Most were from the United States or Canada and about half were in treatment centers and half were in harm reduction sites. Uh, next slide. So we grouped the needs that interventions were attempting to address into these four categories. So there was access to basic resources, women who use opioids, may be precariously housed, may be living in food insecurity, may be living in poverty, um, unemployed, or have ongoing interactions with the legal system. Um, and again, these living conditions are the product of unjust systems of oppression and don't reflect individual deficits. So I encourage you to think about what can we as public health practitioners, as community organizations, as um, as individuals collectively, what can we do to, um, to increase availability of these needs or to pressure governments to ensure that everyone has access to food and shelter and enough money? Um, women who use opioids were frequently subjected to violence, including sexual assault and physical assault in harm reduction spaces, in drug scenes, in transitional housing and shelter spaces. Women who use opioids um, may be pregnant in need of prenatal care. They may be parenting a child in need of childcare. They may be facing custody issues that uh, hinder engagement in services for fear of losing their child. And finally, women who use opioids may require um, general health care and um, so like preventive primary care, including mammograms, uh, cervical screening, immunizations, care for other physical and mental health comorbidities um, and sexual health care. Uh, next slide. So we grouped the interventions um, into five categories. Um, women only spaces were implemented in a couple of settings, including residential treatment facilities, 
uh, transitional housing and drop-in service, a supervised consumption site, and a needle syringe distribution program. Most of these were designated spaces for women, but one was women only hours in an otherwise mixed gender space. One women only space was explicitly inclusive of trans women and non-binary people, um, but the others were uh, didn't specify. The second category of interventions included ones providing comprehensive care. Um, so these are interventions which provided basic needs like housing, transportation, food, clothing, childcare. It also included interventions which co-located health services in the treatment or harm reduction site. Um, so that could include primary care, prenatal care, counseling, contraception and sexual health services, um, but also social services like spiritual care, job training, accompaniment, home visits um, um, for early childhood care and case management. The strengths and skill building category included um, mostly educational interventions like parenting courses, or um, educational session on contraception. A fourth category of interventions aimed to build peer support networks. So one example is a digital storytelling workshop for pregnant women and women with children in recovery from opioid use, where the women created short films about their experiences in a group setting. And they felt that this facilitated connectedness among participants and helped reduce the stigma that they experienced um, since they shared their films on social media and with the broader, um, broader community in which they were living. The women only spaces also created, um, uh, facilitated um, peer support networks um, as they were spaces where women were able to share experiences with each other, to socialize and to build friendships um, with others who have had similar lived experiences. Including Culturally informed programming was a component of um, a, a few interventions, but we wanted to highlight it. One example is providing Indigenous cultural programming on site for Indigenous women to engage or re engage with cultural practices. Next slide. So, a few limitations um, to point out the gender of participants in most interventions was not explored. So except for a handful of interventions which were explicitly inclusive of trans women and non-binary individuals, the experiences and needs of these people uh, were not considered in the design of the majority of these interventions. There was often representation of women with living and lived experiences of substance use in the delivery of the intervention. Um, and participants noted that this created a less stigmatizing environment, but there was limited community control over the design of these interventions. Uh, so using the Ottawa Charter, I thought, could be one way of um, identifying what types of interventions are missing from this review. So we see that most of the interventions fit in um, the two categories, reorient health services or develop personal skills, but very few interventions focused on strengthening community action or building healthy public policy. And this may be a limitation of our search strategy, which included only studies in peer reviewed journals. Um, and so all of the community building, collective action, mutual aid, policy um, advocacy that community based groups are involved in is uh, not captured here. But I think it does point out a gap in the types of interventions that harm reduction and treatment sites are designing, implementing, and um, evaluating and publishing. Finally, there was limited to no focus on how living at the intersection of multiple systems of oppression may produce unique needs that must be met with unique um, interventions. Uh, so despite these limitations, I hope that you find it useful to consider the types of interventions that treatment and harm reduction sites across North America and Europe have tried um, as they, they work to support women and gender diverse individuals who use opioids, um, who are experiencing the fastest rate of change in the burden of harms from opioids in Ontario. Um, and so we will really require tailored interventions to mitigate these harms. Thanks, Julian, for all that wonderful information. It's nice to see all the different strategies that are out there for helping women. 
and gender diverse populations. Um, so I, I'm going to introduce the panel discussion right now. And before I do so, I'd like to just frame the conversation by setting the stage in terms of some of the history that helped to create the issues we're speaking about today. It's important when speaking on this topic, we recognize that colonization has influenced our societal structures and gender dynamics and therefore all the policies. Um, indigenous communities pre-colonization were structured very much based on roles you played within your family unit, which wasn't necessarily nuclear, um, but like a whole community or tribe. So people who played what we call female roles in today's society, as well as male roles, would be called two-spirit. Two-spirited folks were revered and very special. It was thought that they had very close connection to the spirits and creator and the other realms that we can't access. Through colonization and the destruction of our traditions and cultures, two-spirited folks were forced to change the way they dressed and were made to honor their gender assigned at birth and all sorts of awful things happened to them as their culture was decimated. Another thing that happened during colonization was the destruction of the matriarchal society. Indigenous communities are very matriarchal and by decimating the culture and traditions, they also took away the power of the woman. And now we have an epidemic of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. And we have a society that doesn't respect two-spirited peoples the way they should, or as they used to be in our culture. I'm two-spirited and my experience is very different from that of someone who is non-binary because of the cultural aspect attached to my gender and the roles I play within my community and those that have chosen me through my spirit name. I also just want to mention that what they did to us as Indigenous peoples set the stage for apartheid in Africa and these systems of racism, slavery, and cultural genocide have affected our child welfare system in this country immensely and until we fix some of these key issues they will continue to steal Indigenous and Black children. I want to acknowledge that before we have our conversation, I wanted to acknowledge that before we had our conversation and set the stage for some of the history that led us to having to even have this discussion today. So now I'd like to ask Natalie to speak. So first I'm gonna apologize. Um, I have COVID today, my voice is hopefully gonna work um, and my internet's wonky. So I may have to turn my camera off in order to still be here. Um, my name is Nat uh, Kaminsky and um, I am a harm reduction outreach supervisor at Moyo Health and Community Services, as well as the president of the Ontario Network of People Who Use Drugs. Um, and I've been within this sector for approximately nine years, um, really focusing in and having the opportunity to work on um, women and gender diverse issues through my experiences, both at Y, um, some of the sex work advocacy that I've taken on, um, as well as some gender equity uh, work that is taking place at the Dr. Peters Center. Um, so uh, to begin, um, as we were going through, as Julian was going through some of the um, discussions that happen within research, um, the work that we've taken on um, doing um, Put, applying a gender lens to harm reduction work. Um, when working at the Dr. Peter Center, uh, we did a literary a lit scan and um, we quickly recognized that um, gender diverse communities are often added to women's work or queer work. And oftentimes data is wonky or missing when discussing trans um, affected uh, or trans uh, trans misogyny affected or trans misogyny misogyny excluded communities so male identified at birth or female identified birth at birth non binary people. Um, and oftentimes discussions and within women's um, specific um, research focused highly on pregnancy, parenting, um, and acts of violence. And so when looking at the programs and services and how they're offered, we often see in community women's only hours um, being suggested with a limitation of funding to be able to offer those spaces. Um, 
one of the things that um, we quickly realized through um, our research uh, in looking at barriers to access within overdose prevention settings is that um, one, those spaces can't be offered across um, cities or Canada often um, because of funding limitations, but two, those, those uh, types of programs often don't hold um, communities accountable or services accountable to end the violence that women experience, but rather is isolate them um, within a space um, that is gender exclusive. Um, also, we see sex work positive, um, sex work only hours occurring in, as, in, as opposed to sex work um, positive spaces um, and gender equity lenses being applied um, to the work. My experiences often in my work come from my, like the experiences of my friends, um, as Ashley introduced in my, um, in my intro, uh, I'm somebody who comes from lived experience, um, from being street embedded, um, being a street level sex worker, um, to, doing survival sex work, also a parent and a person who uses drugs. And oftentimes um, when I think about the members of my community that I've learned the most from, um, I, I also can't ignore the fact that most of my friends are dead, um, either mur missing, murdered, or have overdosed. Um, and, oh my gosh, my brain's not working right now. Uh, I'm sorry, I need a second. I just got a really bad headache. Um, yeah, Molly, can you speak and I'll I'll jump in. Yeah, COVID brain is just taking over. Yeah, you're doing great. You've raised such important points. Um, I think it's really valuable for us to be having this time to bring attention um, to the conversation around women and harm reduction and overdose prevention. Um, I think so often we're working in the face of crisis that it's very uh, difficult, you know, when you're always having a crisis response and always um, just trying to respond to the next piece to think about how we build um, and recreate systems of exclusion and um, and colonization in our work. And uh, so I'm really grateful for the framing of this to think about the ways that um, work means uh, around gender inclusivity often falls to women. We know that women are so often already excluded from research, when we look at how programs are formed, they're often based on the needs of service um, users. Uh, and when we look at those, it's always disproportionately um, underrepresenting women. And so rarely do we see those numbers pulled out to pull like what are women's experiences um, and how do we respond to those. And to, to just think about the ways that often, you know, we frame services as women specific in order to address some of the realities and violence that women face with structural and interpersonal um, and the ways that that, you know, it's so hard to respond to the bigger structural realities when we're doing that um, and often just creating systems, recreating systems of exclusion. Uh, yeah. I, my part was gonna to be to share um, a toolkit that we created. Nat and Ashley were both um, part of helping with that, um, as, that brings light to some strategies. Um, so I'll share my screen. I'm just gonna walk you through, I'll give you some tidbits and insights as we go through that. Um, just to also to more fulsomely introduce myself. Um, my name is Molly. I work as the director of the Women in HIV AIDS Initiative, which is a provincial initiative um, that works with women living with or facing structural and systemic risk for HIV. So that includes women who use drugs. Um, and a few years ago, um, one of uh, the areas that we were really focusing on and continue to focus on was around capacity building needs of um, uh, around harm reduction and overdose prevention and, and women who use drugs. So we worked with a group of women who use drugs from across the province to come up um, uh, with some recommendations and strategies and tips to hopefully bring um, bring focus to some realities around women around women who use drugs. Uh, so just to give you a bit of information about this, first of all, to say um, we call it the Wise Women in Harm Reduction Toolkit. Um, we worked really hard to make it trans and cis and non-binary and two-spirited and inclus inclusive. Um, so when I say women throughout. Uh, hopefully, um, there's always areas where we can do better for sure, um, but hopefully um, it is inclusive and we did work hard to make sure we were consulting with um, trans, two-spirited and non-binary femme folks. 
Um, the findings within this are really based again on what women who use drugs shared as consultants in the process. Um, and I want to highlight that it came out in 2020, which is just before the pandemic started. Um, so of course, as the overdose crisis has continued to spiral out of control with a lack of structural and systemic response, um, we know that some of these realities are, are shifted. Um, so, but just to give you a bit of an introduction, first of all, this toolkit is available to all of you. Um, it's on our website. We can mail you copies if you want copies. Um, it comes in a folder format. So there's a bunch of different components in it, which allow you to use it in different ways. If you just want to sort of try it out, you can pick out some practical pieces um, or you can work through it in a kind of more fulsome way. It starts with a sort of introduction guide that walks through, um, you know, what is why the Women in HIV AIDS Initiative, and then also goes through each section of the toolkit, so you can kind of know where you might want to direct your attention. Um, it starts with a snapshot, um, which gives some insights into who participate participated in the toolkit creation. Um, first of all, you'll see sort of across Ontario, we worked really hard to have representation that's not just based in Toronto or urban centers, um, but also looks at some of the unique realities of more northern regions or rural regions um, and suburban regions and women's experiences there. Um, you'll also see, um, I don't know how well you can see this, but on this little pie chart, it shows that almost half of the participants were Indigenous women. Um, thanks for the incredible partnership with OHAS and their work. Um, and the other majority of half were white women. Um, that there was much less representation from black and, women, and brown women. And we know that there's some structural realities that have been excluding black and brown communities of women in particular from harm reduction and overdose prevention work. Um, we work to collaborate with a few um, black led organizations to ensure that we're doing justice and in integrating the voices of those communities and making sure we're thinking about how to position harm reduction work to be inclusive and responsive um, with those communities. Um, we also included some demographics around the number of people with children. Uh, and I want to just highlight this is really important to think about because we know that women experience so much stigma and discrimination um, as women who use drugs and as parents. Um, and so it's really important to think about how that stigma impacts people's capacity and willingness to use a harm reduction program and the violence that they may face with questionings. We know that many people have policies that means that they need to call CAS and sort of some um, perception that if you're parenting, you must be neglectful of your children. Um, and also to note that many women have themselves been part of residential school systems or the child welfare system and themselves experience some of that intergenerational trauma. So it's really important part in, in the lens of working with women. Um, we collected some information on relationship status, knowing that that really impacts people's capacity to navigate safety and use. Um, and also drugs of choice. Um, at that point in time, again, it was a couple of years ago, um, we saw that stimulant use was the most predominant followed by opiate use. Um, and importantly to highlight, we also noted that uh, three quarters of the women who participated uh, were, were using multiple drugs. And that's something we don't always talk about. We're often taught to collect sort of primary drug of choice. Um, and we know with levels of drug toxicity, this is, it's really important to talk about combinations of drugs. Um, and then we collected information on overdose and the number of times people have responded to overdose, as well as whether people carry naloxone, um, knowing that often, you know, women, if they're in a co-drug using relationship, they may be second on the needle, or if they're um, with a, a partnership, um, that again, they may be using um, second on the needle or even further down the line, uh, which positions women to be more likely to be responding to overdose in many scenarios. Um, and so that means that it's really important for our overdose prevention work to be reaching women and thoughtfully including women in that work. Um, there's a section that's about wise practices um, that were created by, by women. Um, so it goes over things like, um, you know, meaningful ways to involve women who use drugs in your work uh, and ways to build relationships with women. Um, if you think about kind of harm reduction programs that uh, run and knowing that often it's um, a higher percentage of service users are um, uh, male or more masculine, that often it can be people to struggle. And we get a lot of questions about how do we build relationships? How do we more meaningfully involve women in the work? Um, 
There's also a section on women's specific awareness and realities to think about including and, and integrating into your work. Things like how to make sure you're responsive to the needs of sex workers, um, intimate partner violence, uh, parenting and pregnancy. Um, and then there's a piece about program structures. And of note, we know that women use more, like, more likely to use outreach programs than um, an in-house harm reduction program um, because of some of the stigma and ways that they may be identified if they go to those programs um, and other satellite programs. Like if, if there's ways to pick up harm reduction supplies or engage in overdose prevention safety um, at other sites, it's important for us to integrate this into all of the elements of service. Um, I just wanted to add um, one of the points as somebody who does outreach work uh, in the community, uh, you know, we're so often asked to take down people's codes. And so oftentimes if partners come, we write down the code of the person that we're speaking with when working with couples that often is the male partner in, you know, uh, male and female uh, based relationships. And so it's important to ask if you can take somebody else's code to be able to increase the data that you're receiving within your own programs to show who actually is getting support and be able to build programs around them. Sorry, what, Molly? No, that's perfect. Um, now, Lou, is, I learn most of what I know is from Natalie anyway, so you should just jump in anytime. Um, there's a section on harm reduction supplies and, and tips. And so I just, I wanted to highlight a few of these. One is around drug testing kits. Um, of course, in the, in the breadth of um, discussion about overdose prevention, this is a really important piece, but um, it's particularly important for women, not only to know what drugs they're using and be aware of that, um, but also women face a lot of surveillance around drug use and particularly parents. Um, and so if women are going in through for, for drug screening, um, either to have uh, supervised visits with their children or for court related things, um, it can be really helpful because we don't always know what's in the drugs. Um, we don't know how long that can stay in people's systems. And it can be incredibly anxiety provoking for women to um, go into systems where they're gonna be drug screened and not know what's gonna show up in their system if things are lingering in their system or if they're living in places where there's a lot of drug use. Um, so this can be a really important um, tool to have available for women. Also things like having a range of needles, you know, so often I'm in harm reduction programs or drop-ins where they have, you know, one or two different um, sizes of needles. Uh, and to think about, you know, um, people with smaller veins or bigger veins or people who might want to be using intramuscular or subcutaneous injection um, for Botox or silicone or other hormones, particularly for trans communities. Um, and then simple things like knowing that having lighters is incredibly helpful for women. Often when women need a light, they're um, asked for a toke of their drugs or to drug share, and it can often put women in positions of having to um, negotiate things and, and can even, you know, lend to some, um, some issues of violence or, you know, just puts, having a lighter can really empower, empower women. Um, sexual health supplies, basic things like obviously tampons. And I just draw your attention to this little quote here, which says that um, I never went to harm reduction programs until I heard that there were tampons there. And I went to pick up tampons and I can go to get a tampon and then pick up harm reduction supplies without people knowing, or that that's the bridging piece that brought me into a harm reduction program. Um, and things like having, um, you know, pregnancy kits, for example, um, knowing that in some cases women don't have their period if they're using and um, pregnancy can go undetected. Um, having pregnancy kits that are easily accessible can allow women to detect pregnancy eas easily and early and have meaningful conversations about where they're going to get harm reduction based care and support um, and what choices and options are available to them. Um, and the other thing, and I've always joked that um, Q-tips and underwear were like the key to my harm reduction work um, success and that having Q-tips and underwear for women to pick up um, were really helpful to build relationships and having five second conversations with people allows for you to like build a relationship in a thoughtful way. Um, and that these very practical items give women an in to come and say, can I have a Q-tip? Um, and then you can say, you know, if you wanna take any harm reduction supplies for you or friends, feel free to. Um, so just creating these sort of interfaces is incredibly helpful. Um, in, the, in the toolkit, there's also a number of assessment tools that you can use with your team or yourself just to kind of assess like what are some starting points to build on your work around women. Um, there's some kind of, um, you know, 
agree or disagree statements that you can do on your own. Um, there's a facilitator guide that brings up some important points to think about, um, or you can do it with your team or colleagues. Uh, and then there's also some discussion cards that give you kind of a statement or a scenario um, and ask you with your team to discuss um, those and to think through some of the stigma and discrimination that might be underlying the work. Um, to think through things like, you know, how would you support a woman who um, is pregnant and using and understanding things like that, you know, when people are pregnant, they're, they're often named as being drug seeking, um, but actually withdrawal around opiates can actually cause much more harm. Um, and that many times your metabolism goes up. Uh, and so the importance of having access to supportive harm reduction based services around safe drug supply um, in order to ensure the safety of mom and fetus. And so often women are just told to stop using, um, which actually can, can be incredibly harmful depending on the drug that women are using. Um, so it was really fast, but that's the toolkit, just a high level overview. If you want more information, you can go to our website, WHAI. There's a whole page on harm reduction. There's also this little thing at the top that says connect, and we've got workers in 16 different regions across the province. So um, you can connect with a local Y worker. Um, and if you're not sure, you can, of course, also connect with me. My name is on the website. My email is here. Um, and we have toolkits, it's online, you can download it, we can mail you copies. Um, yeah, but just to say, um, we hope it's useful, it's meant to use in different creative ways. Um, and it's really based on like amazing input from women across Ontario, um, including Nat, who is an amazing help on this project and Ashley helped with it and lots of other incredibly brilliant people. Um, I just wanted to add um, a couple of things that didn't I, I didn't have fresh in my mind when I was speaking around some of the things that folks should focus on when working specifically with women or gender diverse people. So exploring things um, like um, safer substance use for parents um, it has been something that often folks uh, request of our program or CAS workers uh, contact us to be able to support folks better. Um, who identify themselves obviously as someone who uses drugs. Um, another thing that um, uh, that I had mentioned while Molly was speaking was um, oftentimes when I'm out in community, I do share with folks um, why I ask for data. And that has been extremely helpful in individuals understanding um, why we need some of those uh, things from them because women and parents are often over surveilled, um, they feel very uncomfortable when first asked for, you know, their name or um, uh, you're asking them questions, say, for harm reduction distribution. And so I never just ask somebody outright. I explain first what I'm doing it for so that I can build some comfort around that um, and not instill fear that somebody is being surveilled. So, um, yeah, the Dr. Peter Center has been doing work specifically around gender equity and overdose prevention services, and that information will be available. Ashley or myself or Molly um, can be a contact once we release the document, um, because we did come out with themes um, as to why people don't connect, um, racism, surveillance, safety, um, not feeling like a space is gender inclusive, um, as well as not only personal safety, but the accountability that comes from operators to make people feel like the space itself is safe. So our police there, what are the relationships like with community, including the neighbors that may not be a part of service. So those are just a couple of things that I also wanted to point out when I had my brain fog. Thank you. Thanks so much to all of you. It's such a wealth of information. Um, always on these conversations, you have such a depth of experience in um, in community and uh, bringing resources such as these toolkits and tips I see shared in um, in the chat box already. Um, we have a, a few more minutes for some question and answer, probably about uh, five minutes at this point. And um, I, Ashley, if you wanted to take any of the, the questions 
and um, and offer them to our uh, speakers um, for a few minutes and, and uh, inviting others if you wanted to raise your hand to speak or um, enter anything else in the chat box for a few minutes of discussion with the panelists. Um, so the first question I saw, and it, it, we kind of touched on it, but I think we can go into it a little more. How can we address the fact that it's so much easier to access harm reduction gear than safer sex gear and dignified menstrual products and not just tampons and pads? Um, so I had answered that in the chat by saying that within my role, uh, I work with community um, businesses that serve women or that focus on sex. So stag shops, um, as well as smaller businesses um, that are sex shops have been really great in making things available, uh, such as sponges that do not have spermicide in them. Um, uh, when it comes to like the diva cups uh, and other equipment, um, there's four or five different brands that are out. I've written in um, as well as uh, working with the violence against women uh, services or um, gender-based violence services. So like our, our local um, shelter that that is for um, gender-based violence and families fleeing from. Um, and so they've had supplies that are in their basement that they don't give out. And, and so we've worked with them and shared a list and been able to collaborate in making sure that we're offering the same, um, the, we're offering the resources out into the community. I think one of the pieces um, that uh, has been really helpful in doing that work is that we've been able to bridge some gaps. So oftentimes sex working women, drug using women, as well as trans folks don't feel comfortable going into a family based setting like a gender based um, violence shelter or housing space, um, oftentimes because of the I don't want to say traditional, but the the belief that it it's a space for mothers and children only um, that are fleeing from um, a heteronormative is that the word uh, relationship? Yeah. Um, just to add on to that, I, there's so many times where I've been working with um, shelters and in particular VAW shelters where I hear we work with women who experience violence, not women who use drugs. Um, we have a no drug use policy or people can't bring their harm reduction supplies in here. Um, and of note, like we have done a number of community based research projects where it shows anywhere from like 80 to 95% of women have experienced violence in the last year of their life. Um, so it's really hard for me to understand how a VAW shelter or service doesn't work with women who use drugs. In fact, um, I would say that they should be specifically working with that population, but it's a, for decades, it seems like it's been a reality. Uh, I'm just going to add to that, that, yeah, the, a lot of the work that Y has done and our harm reduction program has done within um, those shelter spaces has included doing training specifically on what is violence. And um, I think it's incredible how violence is portrayed and seen as an act that requires somebody to put hands on. And, and that is visibly, like it, it is visible. And so discussing just how violence occurs for somebody who's engaged in sex work has been really helpful in bridging some of those um, difficult relationships in community. And I think that, you know, that's, I think that's one of the keys is making sure that you are able to bring people along on the ride as opposed to exclude them from it. And, and we've seen great movement within our shelter system. And so um, I would encourage folks to look at Intern Place and their website and some of the materials, sorry, Embrave, and some of the materials that they've put out recently, as that's another great place to get resources from. Um, there's another question in the chat. So Karen said, we're struggling also to engage women, including pregnant women using drugs to be treated for syphilis in their community. Is there any suggestions? I'm not, um, I, we had a, a chat in the, in the chat about this. I wasn't quite clear. So it's women who have syphilis, who are looking for, who, who need treatment around syphilis, but, and are also using drugs. Is this what you're saying? 
I think so, yeah. Yeah, it, and it, is there, I mean, I what I always think is working with, with street outreach nurses is key um, and working in like informal, thoughtful, warm ways. Uh, so in programming I've done, I've often asked women um, nurses to pop in, do like something warm and friendly that's informal um, and leave and just slowly build a relationship. Cause you know, there's a lot of uh, people have had terrible experience with healthcare providers. So there's a lot of reason to avoid, um, but bringing nurses into spaces where women are comfortable and have trust um, in thoughtful ways can be really helpful. Um, I also have often used um, strategies of working with a group of women who have a shared issue. So whether it's experiences in um, relationship violence, syphilis, yeast infections, at one point we did, we made a little um, community made pamphlet on yeast infections um, to, generate knowledge together. So sitting down with women, either together or individually, doing a short little interview, compiling into a you know cute, accessible pamphlet that can be shared with women in the community. Um, and then it's women actually sharing the information with each other about you know, how to identify um, if there is syphilis, what treatment options are available, what are kind, thoughtful ways to access treatment um, so that women can support women in that, in that space. I don't know if that helps or if I'm quite getting your question, but. We also, when we had our sex workers uh, drop in, we found that having a public health nurse available just to get to know folks that were coming in, um, as opposed to just pushing a service in and being like, now we offer this here. And so the nurse participated in all of our activities and, you know, came plain closed. And it, I think getting to know um, the, the, the services that you don't know is something that's very scary, especially when you've been over surveilled. And if you perhaps, you know, are having STIs as a really, as, as an issue that comes from like consent and being able to negotiate sexual safety with your partner. I think that that, you know, going into a space where there's signs that say, you know, um, that around domestic violence, you're afraid for somebody to get that close to you and get involved in your home life. And so making sure that there's ways for people to get to know somebody on their as, as an individual, I think is really important, especially around, you know, uh, access to sexual health services. I can't think today, and I apologize for how messy my answers are. It's COVID something wicked. You did great, Natalie. Yeah, thank you all. And Natalie, especially uh, dealing with COVID today. There's lots and lots of thanks in the chat pod uh, coming in, some other tips that people have shared. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, but I, it's been a really important discussion today. And huge thanks to, um, uh, to Ashley, Julian, Nat, Molly, um, and also thanking the, um, the capacity building team and uh, Tish Maison and Trudy Karashe, who were key in, uh, in helping us all plan as well. So um, uh, you'll receive a brief anonymous uh, evaluation of today's session. So in, um, encouraging you to respond and give us feedback and suggestions for improvement. And we will save our last moment for, um, for Ashley just to uh, lead us in a moment of silence to close. And thanks so much, everyone. Um. Usually when we do our moment of silence, we like to remember all the people we've lost to the drug war. And when I do this, I, I like I want to remember those people, but I think it's important with this topic that we we also remember all of the women and gender diverse people that we've lost on th through sex work and through violence and all the crappy things that we've had to experience over the over the years on the streets and stuff. So I think it's um, important to remember all those people we've lost and thanks for coming. <laughs>